And we'll look at just one verse, Nehemiah chapter 10, verse number 39. For the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the corn and of the new wine and the oil on the chambers where all the vessels of the sanctuary and the priests that minister and the porters and the singers. Notice the next several words here. And we will not forsake the house of our God. We will not forsake the house of our God. Tonight, Lord, I pray you'd help us. Uh, Lord, uh, we want to take a few moments now and allow the Bible to help strengthen and edify the body of believers. We pray that you would guide and direct all of us. Uh, Lord, reveal to our, our lives and our hearts those things that are very practical that we need to apply uh, to our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. You could be seated. A professor once asked his philosophy class, which do you think is a bigger problem in America right now, ignorance or apathy? The student replied, I don't know and I don't care. And isn't that pretty much that summarizes the nation in which we live, the culture in which we live today? And it's a humorous antidote, but it does sum up what's going on in our world today. Albert Einstein said this, the world is a dangerous place, not because of those who do evil, but because of those who look on evil and do nothing. And as we look at the Bible, all throughout the Bible, the one thing, uh, if we could summarize uh, that one thing that hinders the work of God and the influence of the people of God uh, to accomplish the purpose of God, uh, it would have to be, I believe, the sin of apathy uh, that's among us. It's so easy to become apathetic. And uh, just sort of indifferent and unconcerned and uh, desensitized to that which is around us. We need on a daily basis to deal with our tendency towards apathy. Uh, I struggle with apathy as all of us do. Uh, apathy in regards to our walk with God. Apathy in regards to the responsibilities that we have as a husband or a father or as a mother or a wife or the responsibilities that God's given to us. And so an apathetic attitude or a spirit is that which is going to really... Uh, be a demise for the work and the cause of Christ. By definition, apathy is defined as indifference, or some of the synonyms is indifference, unconcern, half-heartedness, disinterest, and disregard. When apathy infects a marriage, life becomes boring and routine. The couple loses the joy they once had when they first wed. Apathy can affect all of us. It doesn't matter the age. It doesn't matter our economic uh, background or, or education, income level. Kids can stop caring about their schoolwork or the rules of their parents. Apathetic teens, whatever, will just sort of do what they want to do with the rolled eyes and the indifference that they'll have. Uh, employees can be indifferent about the quality of their work or the level of their service. And so it can affect every area of our lives. Let me give you some that closer, a little bit closer to home. Uh, in regards to how it affects our life, maybe the value that we place upon our health, nutrition, exercise. We can become apathetic in our time spent with the family, the cleanliness of our home, the tidiness of one's front yard, the condition of one's financial state, one's responsibility to one another and to God himself. And so the thing that we as human beings need to understand is that we were created to care. And so it is very unnatural for us I don't care. Doesn't matter. God created us to be caretakers of the garden and to care for the garden and, uh, and to be the keepers of the garden. So God created us with that desire to care and that we ought to care uh, about our walk with God. We ought to care uh, about uh, our family, our marriage, and, and the direction we're going. We ought to care about our country and we ought to care about these things. That's the way God created us, but with an apathetic heart, uh, we don't always see the concern that we ought to have. We stop caring and become apathetic and indifferent uh, to the things uh, that uh, are in our lives, and therefore it loses purpose and loses meaning. Because to live is to give, without one, without one you won't have the other. It's more blessed, the Bible says, to give than to receive. God hates indifference. Revelation talks about, he says, I know thy works. Verses 15 to 17, chapter 3. He says that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. 
Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, I have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And so we see that God looks upon uh, the, the church as uh, being very uh, apathetic. One of the things that will ruin and destroy the church is apathy. Uh, we don't worry about uh, souls, where they're going to spend eternity when they die. We don't worry about uh, reaching the next generation for Christ. We don't worry about uh, investing our lives, our time, our talents in the things of God. And so we suffer from apathy, all of us, to some degree in our life. It's, a, it's one of those weeds that Satan sows into your life. And uh, you become apathetic. And long before uh, you ever go in the wrong uh, direction and do the wrong things, you just become a little bit apathetic, a little bit indifferent, a little inconcerned about things in your life. Now, when we come to a context of Scripture in Nehemiah, uh, in these uh, few chapters, Nehemiah was a wall builder. His job was to rebuild the walls and rebuild uh, the broken down uh, fences or the gates and, and to rebuild the wall and to get that all in place. Ezra, on the other hand, would come in and be a part of rebuilding the temple. But Nehemiah's main primary job, primary job uh, was to be a wall builder. And so the wall builders that Nehemiah had were at a challenging crossroad, probably the biggest crossroad they would ever have uh, in their life. Uh, the walls had been restored. The gates had been hung. The construction project was completed. And the temple was now ready uh, to be occupied for worship. And so the greatest challenge that Nehemiah was facing was this. Now that everything is going good, the people of God could be tempted to take God for granted and to become uh, complacent and to become apathetic. And the God that was blessing them, the God that was guiding them, they all of a sudden now become indifferent to God. They take God for granted. And it's so easy in our lives as well to take God for granted. Human nature has a dangerous trait of allowing familiarity or complacency to lure people into carelessly taking something that's valuable, something that's important, something that's very uh, uh, significant in your life, and you take it for granted. So often we don't realize the value of something until that something is no longer a part of our lives. Human nature has that trait. And so how natural it is for us when our lives are in ruin, uh, our lives are messed up, that we fall on our knees before God and we reach up to God and say, God, my, my life is in shambles and God, my marriage is on the rocks and God, uh, my children are prodigals and God, uh, my life is destruction and destroying. God, would you please help me? Would you intercede in my life? God, would you help me? And we call out to God in despair, uh, backed up against a wall and reach out to God. And by the way, that's the right place to be. There's nothing wrong with that. But when God blesses and God restores and God's goodness uh, is once again experienced in our lives, we have a tendency to say, all right, God, I'm good. Everything's all right. And I'm going to take it from here in my life. Thomas Jefferson said in his notes on Virginia, quote, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just. Now, if Thomas Jefferson has trembled about his country, how much more uh, the leadership of this nation should tremble now. The attitude of carelessly taking for granted how we live can rub off on us. It's a poison. It's a cancer that spreads. And so tonight, I want us to look at how to stop the habit of taking things for granted. And this is the message that will affect all of us uh, because every one of us, take things for granted. And I want to help us become a little bit, uh, maybe uh, familiarized, help reset that button in our hearts and say, you know what? Uh, everything in my life, God's given to me, but so much of it, I'm taking it for granted. So let me give you the first uh, most important thought that we want to look at. Number one, beware of taking God for granted. Beware of taking God for granted. So many times we fail uh, to pray until problems come. We take the gift of salvation for granted. And uh, we, we don't understand how good God's been. Isn't that what uh, Samson did in the book of Judges when the Philistines were upon him? And Samson awoke out of his sleep, the Bible said, and said, I'm going to go out as other times before and shake myself. And he wished not that the Lord was departing from him. Probably one of the 
saddest verse in the Bible is that he took God for granted. He took God's power for granted. He took God's presence for granted. He took God's blessing for granted. He took God for granted. And in so doing, he didn't know that God was not with him when he faced that other battle uh, with the Philistines. And it was that battle where God was no longer there. The power of God, the presence of God, and that God was gone. And where was it he took God for granted in his life? Oh, he was set apart unto God as a child. Judges 13, 4 tells us he was dedicated unto God as a Nazarite, a person entirely set apart for God, but he took God for granted. He wished not. He didn't know. He wasn't aware. He took God for granted. And when God was gone, he had no idea until the storm was coming. The battle was raging. And the enemies of God had come upon him. And so God knew. God knew. And uh, we see here very clearly uh, that uh, he didn't know in the sense of taking God uh, for granted. And so God gives us his grace. God gives us his mercy. God gives us his goodness, but how often we take it for granted. Uh, we take the grace of God for granted. We take the forgiveness of God for granted. So how do you know? Because you say, you know what? I'm going to do wrong. God will forgive me. And I can go live the way I want. And I'll just go to God and say, God, I'm sorry. What are you doing? You're taking God's grace for granted. You're taking the mercy of God for granted. You're taking the forgiveness of God for granted. If you realize how much God loves you and how much it hurts God when we sin, we would less like to say, you know, I can always ask forgiveness. Are we taking the forgiveness of God for granted? Go back to Nehemiah chapter 9 and look in verse number 26. The Bible says, and we're going to look at a couple of these different verses tonight, but it says, nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee and cast thy law behind their backs and slew the prophets which testified against them to turn them to thee, and they wrought great provocations. God tried to draw them back to himself, and God tried to reconcile their fellowship once again. The Bible says, nevertheless, they put the words of God, and they put it behind their backs. They didn't want to hear the truth. They didn't want to follow the truth. They, they got rid of the preachers of God. They spoke the truth, the prophets of God. They testified against them. They wanted their ears tickled. They wanted to hear what they wanted to hear. They didn't want to hear the truth, and they said, that's enough, and God turned on them as we're going to see in a moment and nevertheless God says you're taking God for granted and the Bible says they wrought great provocation God they said we know what you want we know what you want us to do we know how you've called us and uh, what you've called us to do and we know what our responsibilities are we've considered your goodness but we're neglecting it we know what the purpose of our life is but we're not following it we're not going to do what you tell us to do they neglected God they neglected God in their lives. They were good. They, 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 you were a good God. They understood that. But they refused to obey God. And so as we look at this uh, challenge of Nehemiah, uh, the wall was built, the gates were restored, the building project was done. But now in the good times, in the blessed times, in the non-threatening times, in the non-battle times is the biggest danger of apathy or taking, neglecting, taking advantage and neglecting God's presence in our lives that we learned about this morning. So that's number one, beware of taking God for granted. Let me give you some, some principal thoughts that are built on this as well of how to stop the habit of taking things for granted. Number two, think what it would be like. Regularly think what it would be like not to have something. Regularly think what it would be like not to have something. We often think of what it's like not to have something when we don't have it. But you can't bring back what you don't have even though you've learned the lesson now that you don't have it. And so would it not be wise if I become apathetic in my marriage or if I become apathetic in my walk with God or if I become apathetic in my service to God or apathetic in sharing my faith to, to those that know not God, I become apathetic in my church attendance, I become apathetic on living for God, I become apathetic in doing the things of God, would it not be wise to regularly take some time to think what life would be like if that something that I've taken for granted is not there. Some things we just live with day in and day out. After a while, we just assume they'll always be there. We stop seeing the beauty of them and we miss the joy 
of them, we take them for granted. It would do good for us to pray through some things that we just take for granted to help us to not take them for granted so we don't have to lose them or them to be taken away from us for us to realize how much we have to be grateful for unto God. How about some of these things? How about the ability to see? How about the ability to hear, to smell, to taste, to touch, to feel? Those senses, though we take them for granted, uh, so often we can uh, lose them and realize how important they were, but they're gone now. Why don't you think about uh, what it would be like not to see, why you can see. Why don't you think about what it would be like not to hear, why you can still hear. Why don't you think about what it would be like not to taste, uh, why you can still taste, so you can begin to appreciate and value and treasure what you have and not take for granted those things that you have. How about the modern luxuries that we become accustomed to in our world? Running water, hot water, electricity, heating and air, cars, beds, washer, dryers, dishwashers, internet access, and on and on. How about the various freedoms of our country? Most of us have the ability to get up and go wherever we want. Uh, we're not paralyzed. We're not bound to a wheelchair. Uh, we're not confined to a bed. We're not missing limbs. We're breathing on our own. We're not on a ventilator today. We live on an amazing planet that's just the right condition for where we live. The love of your family, of your friends, uh, the many people that have influenced you for the good. Listen, those are things Things that God's given to you. Those are things that we take for granted. But don't you think if we just thought about those things on an occasional basis, on a scheduled time, that we thought about the things you have that you thought you'd always have, but what if you didn't have them? All of a sudden you said, boy, you get in that shower and say, whew, thank the Lord for hot water. Amen? And uh, uh, thank the Lord uh, for a shower that has more than a gallon and a half. Amen, Brother Nathan? And uh, thank the Lord uh, for the sight and the, the sound and all the things that we have. How about This is a hard one, but, but, but for me, but for some of you, we need to thank God for animals. Now, that's tough, I know. Animals, cats especially, but we thank God for animals. Music, laughter, Huh? Thank God for those, as though you didn't have them. Uh, medicine, technical, your medical advancements, the memories that you have. Most of us uh, are, me are mentally uh, healthy and sound. Uh, and, uh, uh, you're, uh, and so you look at those things and say, what would life be like if I didn't have those things? And, uh, and you begin to understand, wow, that's valuable, that's special. I want to treasure that. I don't want to take that for granted. But oftentimes we lose or don't have what we once had and then realize, Wow, I didn't realize how important that was. Why not think about that before? And here's the things that are best that I saved for last. How about justification? You're made right with God through Jesus' work on the cross. How about sanctification? God's working in us to slowly make us into the image of Christ. How about glorification? One day you'll take away our sin and all the negative effects of sin and have a glorified body. How about the adoption? God makes us his sons and his daughters. How about reconciliation? That chasm between righteousness and unrighteousness was abused through Christ. How about propitiation where God's wrath was satisfied through Jesus Christ? How about forgiveness? All of our sins, all of them are gone, gone, gone. Yes, they're gone. How about heaven to come? And the list could go on and on and on. But if we don't take time to think about what you've got as though you didn't have it, maybe we wouldn't take so many things for granted. Maybe as a husband you come home and you regularly think about what it would be like if you didn't have your wife. You walk through an empty home, empty house. And your wife's not there as a wife caring for the, uh, the, the getting the dinner ready or getting the house organized or doing the laundry. And, and instead of griping and complaining about all the things you've got to do, you begin to think about what it would be like to not have a husband to do laundry for. And what if I, I didn't have a husband to fix a meal for? And what if I didn't have a husband to have a house cared for? And all of a sudden you begin to think about what it would be like if you didn't have that husband. What would it be like if you didn't have that uh, wife? What would it be like if you didn't have those parents, those grandparents? All of a sudden you now have a value. You have a significance about that someone that you never maybe had to the extent you should have had, and then you can cherish and value that person or that thing. Why you've got them. Why you have it so you can live a life of no regrets. Why? Because you appreciate what you had while you had it. And so I said, number one, uh, you better make sure that you never beware of taking God for granted. May I say, secondly, think what it would be like if uh, you didn't have that something. 
that you've taken for granted. And so you just list the things, just random stuff. A job and a car and a house and a roof over your head and food in the, the fridge and uh, clothes in the closet and shoes in the thing. and All the things are just sort of random stuff. And you just say, God, if I didn't have those, I had to walk barefoot everywhere. I had to walk with the same outfit, wearing the same outfit all the time. Or the same this, I had to walk to work or whatever it was. All of a sudden you're going to say, you know what? I am so blessed. God is so good to me. Number three, how do we stop the habit of taking things for granted. Number three, gratitude is the opposite of taking things for granted. Gratitude is the opposite of taking things for granted. You cannot be judgmental and grateful at the same time. It's impossible. You can't be critical and grateful at the same time. You can't be discontented and grateful at the same time. Too often we take the blessings of God for granted. How easy it is to take God's blessings for granted. Uh, so as I complain, I'm not being thankful. As I bellyache over what's not fair in my life, I'm not being grateful. As I'm dissatisfied and discontented with my lot in life, I think it's just not right, it's not fair. I, I, listen, I've I got to be grateful because gratitude is the opposite of that which has taken things for granted. And I don't want to take for granted what I have. And if I'm grateful, it allows me to appreciate what I have so I don't have to lose it. So it doesn't have to be gone. So I realize how valuable that something was in my life. God is so good to all of us. But do we ever stop to think that maybe we take many of those things for granted? I like this thought. There's a powerful, solemn truth. What if today you wake up this, with the, the only things, you wake up with the only things that you thank God for yesterday? That's a sobering thought. What if you have today only those things that you thank God for yesterday? How would, your, how would our lives be? We probably wouldn't have a lot of things today. We'd have a lot of things to complain about today that we thought we had things to complain about yesterday. And if we would have been grateful yesterday, we'd realize, man, I got nothing to be ungrateful for or discontented about or critical about or upset about or judgmental about. What am I to think that way? And God says, what is your life? What's it going to be if you're thankful for what you have yesterday and that's what you carry over today? How's life today treating you? For some of us, man, it's a great life. Why? Because you are thankful for things that we often take for granted. You are thankful for your eyesight. You have eyesight today. You'll be glad you were thankful for it yesterday. If you're thankful for family uh, yesterday and you've got family today, you'll be glad to enjoy family today based upon your gratitude of yesterday. We often take for granted the very things that deserve the most gratitude in our lives. We often are the most critical of that which is the most important in our lives. Uh, we'll have husbands and wives that will be so critical and sarcastic with each other. And supposedly that's the most important earthly relationship you have. But why do we act that way to one another as a spouse? Because we just take each other for granted. Uh, siblings will jar and bar with one another and, and uh, disrespect this or that and family and friends and, 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 and parents. And, and Why is that? Because you're just taken for granted uh, that which God has bestowed upon you that God has blessed you with. Listen, we're a blessed people. We're a blessed nation. And God says the remedy of taking things for granted is be grateful for what you have. Thank God in everything. Give thanks. And so God says, are you taking your blessings for granted? Are you taking life for granted? Are you taking what I've given to you for granted? Uh, if not, uh, then, or if, if so, then being grateful might be uh, what you need to do. No one thinks of hot water, carpets, internet connection. I mean, we complain because we got a 100 meg connection or a 200 meg connection or what, you know, uh, this many gigabytes on the phone or this many, you know, well, that's just, oh, this much RAM or, you know, whatever else. And we would just start, we've, we have what uh, is supernatural uh, in what many in this world, uh, we see it as normal. It to them would be luxury. It would be uh, eating high on the hog uh, as a result of that. And uh, any other generation uh, prior to us would have been extraordinary luxuries. And uh, we become the, the standard of normality has changed. Our culture has accepted a particular standard of living. And we begin to assume that that's our right. That's what we deserve. That's what's owed to us. And we want it. We desire it. And we go after it. Not realizing what are you taking for granted 
Are you thankful for what God has given to you? We need to constantly be counting our blessings. We didn't sing that song tonight and thanking God for them. Count your blessings, name them one by one. We sing the song, and yeah, it's a great song, but do we really do it? Do we really do it? And God said, listen, don't take God for granted and, and take time uh, on occasion to think what life would be like if you did not have uh, what you have today. How would your life be different? All of a sudden, you're beginning to cherish and value and, and uh, be precious those things. The privilege to serve, the privilege to, to preach, the privilege to, to work a bus route, the privilege to teach a class, the privilege to help a class, the privilege to prepare a meal, the privilege to pick up someone in your car. All of a sudden it takes on a whole new dimension. We ignore much of the goodness in our life, only missing it when it's gone. So, this week our stove broke. This week our washer broke. And we didn't realize how important those appliances were until they were broke and not working. We thought nothing of the washer or the dryer when it was working. We took it for granted. We thought nothing of the stove when it was cooking and preparing meals. Uh, we took it for granted. It will always turn on. It will, hot water will always come out. And uh, the washer will always work. But why is it that we recognize how important something is until that something is not working it's broken uh, you say well we're all right we did it we did a bunch of loads of of laundry and so the drawers are full for the time being so we're all right for a while but the time will come we'll say boy i wish the washer was working i wish that uh, the oven was working and so why is it that we appreciate the fact that we have a washing machine when it's broken down and then it finally gets fixed as a man i'm glad the dishwasher is fixed i'm tired of washing dishes i'm glad the water heater is fixed i'm tired of taking cold showers i'm glad the washer is fixed i'm tired of going to the laundromat i'm glad why is something got to get broke to realize how important it is once it's fixed. And sometimes things can't get fixed. And so it might be wise to not take for granted and be grateful for what you have. I remember reading a story from the bombing of the Twin Towers in New York. A woman refused to kiss her husband goodbye on the morning and set off for a meeting in one of the buildings because her lipstick was fresh on. She just put her lipstick on. It was the last time she saw him. You know, we take it for granted that our loved ones are coming back home to us when they go to work. There's a lot of loved ones that leave the door to go to work with no, in, with no intention not coming back, and they never come home. They never come home. That's why the Bible says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, because you don't know what a day may bring forth. You don't know what tomorrow may bring forth. Be a tragedy for the last time you saw that loved one. There was anger and there was a contention and there was fighting and there was a feuding and there was, there was a, a, a wedge there. And that was the last time and we see that story, I'm sure, time and time again with the World Trade Center and those towers and other parts of the, the country that uh, those planes flew into. We see a spectacular sunset one evening. It's breathtaking. But what if we're to see that same sunset night after night after night after night? We would imagine that it would lose its splendor. It would lose its amazement. I always thought it'd be neat to see the aurora lights. You'll see some pictures of that. I've never been up, up there in Alaska and things to be able to see those things, the northern lights. But I always see it. There's no way a camera can truly... Yeah, I mean, the only God's camera through our eyes can be able to see the magnificence of that. And, uh, uh, but, you know, I wonder those folks that live there and see the northern lights night after night after night after night. I wonder if it's just become sort of a ho-hum type of thing, not a big deal. They've always seen it. They've always assumed to see it for many more nights. They just take it for granted. We take for granted we fall madly in love with someone, but over time we begin to see more of the flaws in them instead of their beauty. We awaken every morning with our lungs filled with fresh, clean air, ready to live another day. But as we've done so many times before, we assume it'll happen again and again. And over time, waking up loses its novelty. It now becomes a chore to get out of bed. It now becomes a burden and a bother to get out of bed when we were just excited at one time have another day of life. 
and it's lost the thrill of life. You see, gratitude unlocks the fullness of life. It turns what you have into enough and so much more. Let me say that again. Gratitude unlocks the abundant life. It takes what you have and gives you what you need and so much more. Isn't that what happened with that little lad and his fish and the loaves of bread? And uh, the multitude was commanded to sit down. 5,000, the wives and the children. So there's probably 10, 12, 15,000 people there. A little lad with a little lunch there. And he pulled out a, a few fish and a little bread. And they said, I got this to give. And Jesus says, sit him down. And he looked up to Father and thanked God for what God provided. And God, through a grateful heart, provided what they need and much, much more. And God says, you want to have an abundant life? Then don't take for granted what you've got. Be grateful what you have. And God will supply your need and so much 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 more it unlocks the abundant life if you're waiting for the abundant life to just sort of uh, 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 open up on you and you're ungrateful and you're uh, critical and you're uh, discontented and dissatisfied you'll never know what it is to enjoy the abundant life second thessalonians chapter one can you turn there please we're going to be in Thessalonians here for just a few moments here as a couple of these thoughts are going to, are going to uh, transition together. Look in uh, first, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter uh, number 1 in verse number 3. We're talking about how to guard against or prevent us from slipping into uh, the habit of taking things for granted. Don't take God for granted. Have some time in your life where uh, you, uh, you think about what life would be like if those just common normal things in your life weren't there. We saw be grateful. Gratefulness unlocks uh, uh, that which is a, a full and abundant life. Look in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We are bound. We are bound. We are obligated to thank God always for you, brethren, as is meet because of your faith growth is seedly and the charity of every one of you towards each other aboundeth. Paul says we're bound to thank God always for you. It was an obligation to continually be thankful for people. Listen, you won't get critical of people if you're thankful for people. You won't get mad at people if you're thankful for them. If you're thankful for your husband providing for the needs of the family. If you're thankful for your wife and caring for the kids and the home. If you're thankful, you'll appreciate shape one another. Griping, complaining, belly aching in relationships. Always a result of an unthankful heart. Ungrateful. And so God says, abound to thank God always for you. So we need to be thankful. But look at the next thought. Go to verse number 11. Not only do we need to be grateful, and gratefulness is the opposite of uh, taking things for granted, but we also need to pray one for another. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 11. Wherefore also we pray always for you. He just says we're to be thankful to God always for you. And this I want to, I want to let you know we always pray for you. That our God would count you worthy of this calling. Fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. So Paul says continually, I'm going to continually thank God for you. I'm not going to let Satan cause me not be thankful for you as a, as a Sunday school worker. I'm not going to allow God to cause me to be unthankful for you uh, as, a, as a, a servant of the church of God. I'm not going to allow God to cause me to be unthankful towards you. But I'm also not going to allow uh, Satan, I'm sorry, to cause me to not be praying always for you. Uh, look what it says here. He says, I'm going to pray for you. Continually pray for you. Take your Bibles go to 1 Thessalonians now. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And verse number 13. You see, the next point here, how do you guard against taking people, taking things for granted? Pray one for another. You won't take someone for granted that you're praying for. But if you're not praying for someone, you're taking that someone for granted. When's the last time, ladies, you prayed for your husband? When's the last time, mom, you prayed for your kids? Husband, when's the last time you prayed for your wife? Dad, for your children. Grandma, grandpa, for your grandchildren, for your children. When's the last time you prayed? Who you pray for are people you're not going to take for granted. Why? Because Paul said, I'm going to thank God always for you. Why? I don't want to take you for granted. I'm going to pray always for you. Why? I don't want to take you for granted. If I'm not thankful for you, if I'm not praying for you, I'm taking you for granted. And if you're not thankful for people, and you're not praying for people, 
then you're taking people for granted in your life, the most important people in your life. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13, for this cause. Also thank we God without ceasing, because when, we, when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as is, is truth, the word of God, which is effectually worketh also in you that believe. And he says, without ceasing, uh, we're praying. So gratitude and prayer are bookends of the same thing. So if I want to protect the relationship that I have with my wife, the book is to help me, and, I, and we have to guard it. All of us are prone to take those that are most important in our lives for granted. All of us are. And, and that's a natural trait that we have. And so if I want to guard that, then what I need to do, I need to regularly be aware, consciously aware, and being thankful for my wife. And that means not just in my heart being thankful for who she is or what she does or uh, uh, what a blessing she is in my life, but also verbalizing to her, communicating to her how thankful I am for her throughout the day and throughout the week and throughout the years of my marriage. Thankful, thankful, always thankful. And then also the other book in is I need to always be praying for my wife. If I want to guard taking her for granted. Now, Tonight, just on those two points, there's a lot of very valuable, special people in our lives that we're taking for granted. We're taking them for granted because we're not thankful for them and verbalizing it, and we're not praying for them and letting them know, I've been praying for you, I'm praying for you. Because when you pray for someone, that knits your heart. When you're thankful for someone, that knits your heart to that someone. It makes you more aware of how valuable and important they are in your life. You see, in one case, it is what you need. Uh, in one case, it is what you need. On the other case, it's what you already have. I'm thankful for what I have. I pray for what I need. So I'm thankful for you, for what you, what, I, what, you've, what you are to me. I pray for you because I need that important value in my life. And so as a pastor, the most important thing I can be for you, to be the greatest influence for you, is the same bookends that a husband and wife need to have for each other. I need to be thankful for you, and I need to pray for you. You know, the greatest thing you as a church member need to do to have a good heart and spirit towards uh, your pastor is the same thing. You need to be thankful and you need to pray. If you're not thankful, you'll be critical. If you're not thankful, you'll be sarcastic. If you're not thankful, you'll be judgmental. If you're not thankful, and we could add all those other things. If you're not praying, the same thing. And same thing with me. If I'm not thankful for you, I'm going to be critical about you. I'm going to be uh, impatient about you. I'm going to be short about you. If I'm not praying for you, I'm going to be a little bit looking at your negatives instead of positives. I'm going to be focused on what you're doing wrong instead of what you're doing right. Because God says, you better not take for granted uh, your church family. You better not take for granted uh, those in leadership over you. You better not take for granted the proofs we have to serve together for the cause of Christ. But if we're not praying for each other, if we're not thankful to each other, then we're taking each other for granted and we're becoming apathetic. And we've created a spiral of, of decline in our relationship where Satan can get in. Think about your family. Think about your pastor. Think about your church family. These are people whom it's very easy to take for granted because they're always there. You show up, pastor's always there. Sister so-and-so is always there. Brother so-and-so is always there. Uh, dad's always there. Husband's always there. Mom's always there. Grandma's always there. Grandpa's always there. Brother so-and-so, they're always there. They're faithful. They're faithful. Praise God. But wait a minute. You better not take those people in your life for granted. And so how do you guard against that? You have to always be thankful. You have to always be praying for those people. So tonight... It would be wise to look at those people in your life that are important to you and then say, okay, how important are they to me? I don't know. How, how thankful are you for them? I don't, I don't know. How much are you praying for them? Because if we're not doing those two things, then we're taking each other for granted. I'm taking you for granted. You're taking me for granted. We're taking each other for granted. Taking our marriages, our homes, our families. We're taking each other for granted. And so uh, these are people whom it's easy to take for granted. We always have them. Instead, today, let's thank God for them. 
Uh, let's pray for them. And uh, gratitude helps us, listen now, gratitude helps us remember what we have. Prayer helps us to see what we have. That would be a good one to jot down because that's important. Gratitude helps us to remember what we have. Prayer helps us to see what we have. I want to see what I have while I have it so when it's no longer here, I don't have regrets that I neglected and was uh, not uh, caring and concerned and neglecting that which I had. Um, who should you thank God for today? Who should be on your thank God today list that, that's important to you? That's important in your life. If you're not thanking God for them, who is? If you're not praying for them, who is? And if we're neglecting them, then I imagine there's others also that are being neglected as a result. Uh, take the time and show, uh, show God uh, that, uh, that you understand. He put people in your life that God can love you through. God can help spiritually grow you through. God can help nurture you through. God can help mold and shape you through. There, there are two that God uses in all of our lives. And so be thankful, be thankful, be thankful, and pray for them. The, the man that led me to the Lord uh, as a nine-year-old boy in San Clemente, California, uh, I want to, on a regular basis, be thankful. He's not, uh, he doesn't uh, believe as, as we would believe, and he's drifted in a lot of different areas and compromised in a lot of different areas. But you know what? I am not critical of that man because I'm thankful for him. I want to pray for him. You know why? If it wasn't for him at that stage of my life years ago, I wouldn't be saved today. And so I'm thankful for them. The one that led you, Lord, you better thank God for them. You better let them know you're thankful to them. And you ought to pray for them. So oh, they're not even in church anymore. How much more to be thankful for them? Because they were in church long enough to impact your life. They were serving God long enough to make a difference in your life. You know what? Many of us would be much longer in the ministry if others were thankful towards us and others were praying for us, giving us that strength that we need to go on. Here's next. Let me hurry up. Let me hurry up. These are basic points. Nothing, nothing uh, I, you know, enlightening here, but, but basic truths. Uh, here's the next one. Uh, how to guard against becoming, uh, taking folks for granted, taking things for granted. Live life in the moment. Live life in the moment. The only reason we become complacent towards the beauty that surrounds us is we fail to live in the moment of now. Rather than living in the moment, we're often too busy thinking about the next place we have to be, what we're going to eat for lunch, what we're going to fix for dinner, who we're going to meet with the next day, the next week, the next month. And all this mental chatter causes us to miss the moment of now. Uh, and so, how do you not take for granted things? Live in the moment. Cherish the moment. Cherish now. We have no guarantee tomorrow. Life's a vapor. It appears for a little time. It's gone. Now's the accepted time. Today's the day of salvation. God's a present tense God. And so uh, all this mental chatter pulls us away from the beauty that lies in the present and causes us to become disgruntled, unappreciated, distracted, and we miss. Folks come from all around to visit this region. Lake Tahoe and and uh, the beauty of the, the Sierras and all of this here. And we see it day in and day out. And we don't stop to, to see the wonder and the splendor. We've lost the, the amazement of it. We've lost the amazement. We've just taken it for granted. We become, when you become immediately present, you therefore open up yourself to receive all that God has before you. You'd be surprised how much good God has for you if you just live in the moment. But you're so focused on what isn't right in your life and looking forward to what would be right if some changes took place, you miss the package of right now. And so God says, listen, don't take for granted. So when you're with family, live in the moment. Cherish the moment. Boy, Brother Curtis, it was a thrill today. And boy, they were on, they were on cloud nine. They, I was so excited for them. And uh, they were here for Sunday school, and, and then one of the kids came in, and the grandkids were coming in, another kid came in, and the gang in the laws, and everybody, else. and boy, they were all spread out. And uh, you know what? They, they, they stayed to eat the potluck. What were they doing? They were in the moment of now. 
And they said, man, this is great. And uh, they weren't rushing, eating their food while we're now with the family. We're in church. And, and they drove from Fallon and in here. And man, this is great. And we're in the moment of now. And they took some pictures. And they would walk out and uh, just strolling around. Like, they're living in the moment of now. Listen, that's the way not to take for granted today. And they go back to home tonight. You're driving home tonight. I said, you know what? Wasn't that a great day? Wasn't that a great day? Uh, you know why? Because it's great because you lived in the moment of, you cherish the now, the now that you're able to experience uh, together. Uh, when you're fully present in your life, you never miss a sunset because you're too busy, because of co the colors of the sunset cause you to stop and look. You're in the moment. And that sunset will never be what it is tonight. Never. Never, never. When the snow comes down and you're dreading getting the shovel and shoveling out and getting the chains on the tires and say, live in the moment. Enjoy the snow coming down. We love doing the uh, snow ice cream. And uh, it's been tough getting snow ice cream the last uh, several years because we'll put our big old metal bowl out in the front yard and uh, uh, we'll get out there. I mean, they're just a little nothing out there. But this last storm we had, well, we got the bowl out there and uh, it filled up. And we brought in and made that homemade ice cream. We were living. Now I was thinking, I'm going to got piled up more and more and more. And I'm thinking, you know what? I knew I'm going to have to shovel the next day and I'm going to have to shovel things down and everything. But I wouldn't worry about that at all. I was enjoying living in the moment of now. Now, tomorrow did show up to shovel, but I was enjoying the moment. And so many of us miss life because we're not living in the now. We're not living in the now. We were coming to church tonight, our family, and boy, I tell you what, we were crying, we were laughing. I mean, crying because we were laughing, and we were cutting up and joking and having, we were having a time. And uh, you know what we were doing? We were living in the moment. Enjoying life now on the journey to church. And, uh, you know, we have no guarantee. And, uh, boy, you come to church and uh, you're with family today, you're with a spouse today, you're with your kids today, you're, you're able to serve today, you're able to, to work and serve the work of God today. Man, just live and bask in the moments of now. And then may I end on this, I'm done. We need to be repenting of our grumpiness and our dissatisfaction. We need to be repenting of our grumpiness and our dissatisfaction. Any blessing that we have is a gift from God. And it should cause us to be grateful, never an excuse for a complaint. Perpetually grumpy people are so focused on what is not right, they miss and overlook what is right. You see, if I'm going to overcome the grumpies, I've got to quit feeding that Part of my life. Often grumpy people are attracted to the information and people who encourage their grumpiness. There's never an excuse to be grumpy. Never. You get grumpy when life has not gone your way, the way you want it. You get grumpy because uh, others have interrupted your plans. You get grumpy because others have sometimes irritated you. You may, not, you may even just wake up grumpy sometimes for no apparent reason at all. You see, grumpiness works itself into, the, out of the, into your mind, so you keep chewing over the thoughts of how you've been wrong and disappointed. You become irritable, short-tempered, snap, and uh, focus on all that's bad, and we become grumpy. Let me just say this. It's one of those unpreached about sins. Grumpiness is a sin. Worry is a sin. Grumpiness is a sin. And so if we can recognize that grumpiness is a sin, then we can be deal, begin dealing with it like all the other sins. You say, well, how do you deal with grumpiness? Same way to deal with every sin. God, forgive me. I was wrong. I was grumpy. There's no excuse. There's no reason to be grumpy. Now go back to Nehemiah, last verse. Nehemiah chapter 9. Remember I told you about the nevertheless we saw a moment ago uh, in uh, Nehemiah chapter at number nine, uh, where he uh, talked about uh, uh, the importance of them coming back to God, and they turned the word of God behind them. In verse number 26, nevertheless, they were disobedient, rebelled against thee, cast the law behind their back, slew the prophets who testified against them to turn them to thee, and they wrought great provocation. Nehemiah 9 26. But look at Nehemiah 9 31. Here's another nevertheless. Nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, thou didst not utterly consume them, nor forsake them. For thou art a gracious 
and a merciful God. Here's what happened. In spite of all the evil they had done, nevertheless, God was gracious. In spite of all the goodness of God that they had taken for granted, nevertheless, God was still there. In spite of all the sins that he committed, nevertheless, God uh, was there. The mercies of God were still there. In spite of all the things that we have done that are godless and wicked, nevertheless, in spite of all the complacency and apathy in our lives, nevertheless, why is God so gracious and merciful? I'll tell you why. It's not because we deserve it. It's not because it's uh, uh, something we're deserving of. It's because God promised it. God says, I will be merciful. Nevertheless, you turned your back on me. You put your word, my word behind your back. You killed the prophets that were telling you the truth that you didn't want to hear. You, uh, you, you, you did your own thing. And God says, but nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, thou didst not utterly consume them or forsake them, for thou art gracious and merciful God. We ought to thank God tonight with all the things we take for granted in life that nevertheless, God is still gracious, and God is still merciful. And a message like tonight can just hit that reset button. You say, you know what? I'm taking a lot of things for granted. I'm taking a lot of things for granted. Many of us have that which others are praying for. Your husband and wife come to church tonight as a couple. We have some in our church that would give anything. They're praying to be able to come to church with their spouse that they'd come to know Christ as their Savior. And you're taking for granted, we're, we're taking for granted that as a couple we're able to come to church together. Don't take that for granted. Don't take that for granted. You're here tonight as a family and you've got your, your spouse and your kids are here and together you're in church and there's those in our church that said, boy, we would give anything if our kids would just get back tied into church. If we can come to church as a family, boy, that would be so wonderful. And we that have families in church sort of just take it for granted. Just take it for granted. We have a place, an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, old-time, old-fashioned church, and we come to church and, and we just sort of take it for granted. Not realizing that there's folks that will drive miles to come be a part of a service of an independent Baptist church. We just sort of take it for granted. We get in our cars, come to church. We've got some that will come an hour and a half drive to come to church on a Sunday morning, back on a Wednesday night, and for a soul winning time. They'll, they'll, they'll come many miles, and we just sort of take it. It's just right around the corner for us compared to that, and we, can, we don't want to take it for granted. The verse we gave you, we don't want to forsake the house of God. Don't take for granted the work of God, the ministry of God, the service that we can have for God. God loves you. God's blessed you with everything you have. Let's not take it for granted. Let's be thankful. Let's pray. The book ends that'll, 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 that'll solve and reconcile and help you appreciate what you have. Father, thank you for tonight. 